Lyons Color Report. Most of you are well acquainted with its remarkable achievements and therefore my introduction will be very brief. Professor Klein is one of the leading, leading scholars in the field of history and theory of 19th and uh, 20th century architecture, interaction of civilization as it is reflected in architecture, contemporary architecture and synagogues in Central Europe. Professor Klein will speak today on the synagogue of uh, Sabotica, the wonderful art involved uh, synagogue in Hungary. Thank you so much for this uh, raising words. Uh, I would like to express my gratitude to Dr. Uh, Levin for the invitation to this uh, fantastic conference. And the Jews had a difficult task 
to adapt and uh, themselves uh, to the Hungarian folklore, uh, which was, you see from the image, uh, mission impossible. <laughs> but they tried to master the problem. Um, this is an even more explicit pairing. It, it is a bit arbitrary on my side because the upper image is uh, early 20th century and uh, the other images on, on my side is mid 20th century. But nevertheless, you see the difference. Uh, people going on Shabbat morning to the synagogue, uh, these are not rows, they are just going, you know, in a very nonchalant way. But these Christian ones, uh, you know, they are uh, in pairs, girls, uh, couples, married couples, and, and so on and so forth. Uh, what is even more important, for the Jews, visuality. For the traditional Jews, visuality doesn't really matter. For them, visuality is the name of the game. So, this is really something difficult for the Jews to digest. But they try their best. So, if we speak about architecture, uh, there are different sources. How to render synagogue architecture in The first item is to use Hungarian vernacular architecture. And this is the image where you see uh, peasant houses in villages and the gabel repeats on the gabel of the synagogue. By the way, these houses have nothing to do with the uh, Hungarian culture. Uh, Hungary was occupied by the Turks, and when the Turks were expelled, these were Austrian engineers who created the types of Hungarian peasant houses, and a certain Baroque got vernacularized. So from architecture, professional architecture became a folksy architecture, and this folksy returned to the professional architecture of the synagogue. Sorry for these terms, these were the terms used yesterday. I, I don't agree with these terms, but nothing better uh, is at hand at the moment. Uh, then the next source will be Hungarian folklore, textile, pottery, and then what is the most important issue in all this? Uh, breaking up uh, vernacular language. So breaking up uh, the syntax and the words. In this adapting the folksy, you have folksy word, the words, the motives, but the syntax is professional. The syntax is of architectural history, of architecture in an academic sense of the world. The levels. Uh, folklore, uh, the first and most important level, the composition of volumes of the synagogue has nothing to do with folklore. This is the Byzantine Pentiridion type, which was a fashion from the 1880s in Germany after Opler uh, until World War II this was the type. The next level is the single volume where we already see the motives of the folklore but it's still 3D. Then we have the contour, uh, the perimeter of the walls which is 2D and then we have the surface which is again 2D. So um, there are different types of, of, of folklore motives. Um, the potted plant uh, this is taken from a village Lutheran church and it then goes to the Pentateuch of the synagogue. So this is the type of folklore that goes from one point and branches. So the plant is an element of folklore. And the other type is uh, the decoration which we call it horovacui, the folklore decoration that covers a complete surface and then it also uh, goes into uh, the synagogue's um, main entrance. Um, folklore is classified as um, linear. Um, this is the linear folklore. We will see how is it applied in the building. Uh, above we have the so-called macho folklore, which uh, the architects were uh, really ignorant in terms of Hungarian folklore. They spoke about Transylvania and Transylvanian folklore because Transylvania is a sort of holy place for the Hungarians that was not occupied by the Turks, not occupied by the Austrians, which was genuinely Hungarian. I don't know what is genuinely Hungarian, but this was an expression of, of, of the, the period. And actually they went to the outskirts of Budapest and uh, copied uh, this folklore and it shows up on the ceiling and it shows up on the perimeter walls and painting. Another type of folklore ornament is on uh, the edges. So
So we have uh, the beams, these are steel beams, so it is a serious structure. At that period you couldn't show the steel beam, it wasn't considered a standing. So it had to be clad, and this is this Semperian Decaidung's theory, and this is now how this Hungarian folklore pattern uh, covers up. Um, in the railing you have a, a truss, and this is the main steel beam, and here you have the whole truss uh, presented as uh, folklore. And then this, uh, this is quite an interesting theory. It's a well-known uh, folklore uh, shape that went to the, to the arc of the sea level. Quite a strong statement. Uh, another transfer, I, sometimes I speak about transfer, sometimes I speak about transfiguration. I prefer the latter because it has this uh, Christian um, um, religious connotation, so let's speak about transfiguration. And on the left hand side, you have a plate uh, for Eastern ham and eggs, and on the left you have, this is the same, same story, a baby leaf, and a baby leaf called a palm tree, but it, palm leaf, but it's not exactly a palm leaf on the other map of the show. Now, uh, there is a combination. I spoke about breaking up uh, the original syntax and picking some motives. Uh, we have the module on the left hand side uh, with the um, idea of the seed and layers around the seed and then uh, this opens up the type of tulip which is a national flower of Hungarians, Turks, Dutch and so on and so forth uh, which shows up here. It's also interesting that this um, surface decoration can get along with the structure because here this shows up is a keystone. So it is not really a keystone, but it is uh, functioning as a keystone in visual terms. And now I will address these are just the details, um, how it goes. This is the complete uh, structure, um, absolutely modern structure for 1901-1902. Um, sort of shell structure which has ribs on the river side, uh, which is painted uh, wall painting is either on flat surfaces or on curvy surfaces. What is more important, um, the decoration, the folklore, goes into 3D, jumps up one level higher in architecture. So, uh, we have the folklore, which is visible on the central dome, which is the focal point of the space, and the space extends and all this uh, spatial gain is emphasized by folklore. So uh, it guides your eye to discover a uh, spatial relationship. So it is the main dome, the subdivisions, which is a sort of transit. Then it goes to the shape of the ceiling. And finally, it goes to surfaces. Now, there is a different type of decoration for flat surfaces, i.e. the perimeter walls and ceilings. The synagogue structurally has massive perimeter walls and steel and uh, concrete uh, um, structure inside, very, very light. So it is actually uh, a sort of tent and the architects were very eager to emphasize this tent-like uh, character of the building. And I borrowed some images from Thomas Hupka. Um, there is a quotation that I'm not going to read, even not in translation. Uh, the architects uh, description uh, states that the shape of the dome is an association to the tent in the wilderness. Um, I'm not sure um, how did they got to this, how did they um, get to this shape, but it's pretty similar to the Borgetz uh, shape, how it goes convex, concave, in terms of section. And also in terms of plan, so it's an axonometric by Hupka, and this is my uh, autocad of axonometric about uh, the stent um, in the interior. Now, uh, the decoration on uh, the curved surfaces is again um, different. 
Uh, on the one hand, it emphasizes this pseudo risk. So this, this is like that. Yeah? And it emphasizes uh, the openings, the windows. And below we have decoration below the window. Um, he wanted to avoid traditional architectural <coughs> historic uh, tricks. Now, um, there are three types of uh, paintings. The blue is uh, emphasizing the tectonically uh, important uh, spots. So these are uh, pseudo ribs, I would say, but there is a rib on the upper side. So this is type one. Type two is the decoration, uh, folklore decoration wall painting, which is independent from tectonics. It is a sort of pendant tip, and this is really uh, statically uh, speaking the neutral part, the fill up. And then you have the steel beams here that are decorated with another repetitive uh, motif. The same applies uh, to the dome, the tent in the wilderness, where you have uh, tectonic or pseudo tectonic uh, folklore decoration, wall painting. You have wall painting that emphasizes the openings, uh, free ones, um, and uh, this is the interplay of this uh, three type of decoration. All these drawings were done by the architects. The complete documentation, uh, documentation is there preserved. So the point of this synagogue is that it breaks the tradition that you have traditional architectural historic shapes, subordinated to it you have structural solutions, and the outcome is the architectural form. Now it is the way around. You have the starting point of the folklore, which go to structural solution and end up in architectural uh, form and space. So this is just to show you uh, the detail that this folklore, this repetition, is already 3D. And this is this rib which uh, carries this, and this is another rib. Actually, this functions as a rib because it's a 3D structure that uh, has a, a moment that can carry uh, the load. Now, uh, the control group is Seged Synagogue, which is uh, the source of this dafke. Um, it's important that in Segev there is a clear hierarchy of, uh, of the Gesamtkunstwerk. It is a, a, a Gesamtkunstwerk, a total work of art, but it has the hierarchy. There, the wall painting is definitely a servant. Um, motives of architectural history show up. This, for instance, if you have uh, in front of your eyes the entrance to the Atla Shul, uh, it is almost exactly the same decoration. Uh, the Pandantiv has some uh, Renaissance, Neo-Renaissance references. Here it is all without that. It is something that is uh, grassroots, folksy, and folksy is elevated to uh, the architecture with uh, capital A. For instance, uh, the transition between the drum and the dome in Sagat, where you have you have wall painting, which is Israeli, by the way, the fauna. The flora and fauna of the Holy Land, as it is written by Leopold Baumhorn, and the rabbi uh, who was a researcher of this um, uh, um, subject and published books in Germany about it, this is all refused as irrelevant, and the Hungarian folklore and being Hungarian is the most important message of the building. Now we have uh, something. Uh, there is no Jewish inscription, moreover, it's important. On the Seged Synagogue, on the Pendantiv, you have Avodah, your service. You have um, a sort of oculus, uh, golden oculus, uh, in a, in a Pendantiv. And the Subotica Pendantiv is actually not a Pendantiv, it is not connecting one color uh, with a drum, but it's a double uh, Pendantiv. Uh, the continuity between wall painting and the stained glass windows on the left hand side, we have Sagat with the freestyle, with the Gothic, with the Romanesque, uh, with the Renaissance. And here we have just folklore applied to a dome which is not entirely a read of architectural historic references. Our lower part is a bit like uh, uh, Santa Maria della Fiore. The upper part is like San Marco from the outside. 
But from the inside, it is a Hungarian Jewish tent of the builders. And uh, this is the ark in Szeged. All these arcs uh, have an organ which is fake. I've seen over 500 synagogues. Uh, these organs are fake. This is just timber. You don't have the long pipes. You don't have the short pipes. This is just a decoration, and the organ is behind. But in Szeged, it is a very important freestyle, almost church-like composition. And here you have something which is a mix of Hungarian folklore and certain oriental, it's a sort of acroteria, it's a sort of uh, uh, Asian uh, Middle Eastern architecture, and uh, the Lukot is getting the flame around in a little uh, parabolic uh, form. And these are these details, and uh, let me jump to the summary, I have still a minute and a half. Uh, there is an architectural theoretical summary that uh, this is uh, Gesamtkunstwerk. Uh, with a very intense interaction of different aspects of, of uh, visual art. It is Semper's both Stoffwechsel and the Kleidungstheorie. Stoffwechsel is when you have a form that uh, comes from one material to the other, like the Greek temple that was built in timber, and now it is in stone and it can go to plastics and whatever you want. Modernism. Uh, modernism is a very important statement of the Jews because they are the industrialists, they want to show uh, very slender uh, material, it is visible that it's, it's steel, it's a modern uh, material, the refusal of Gentile, architectural, historic, Christian uh, tradition, and the most important problem, uh, point is reaffirmation of the surface as a bearer of meaning. So the surface is uh, meaningful, and it conveys this meaning of hybrid uh, uh, Jewish uh, Hungarian identity. If we put this into a historic context, we can say that there are some historic roots to this folk scene. This is uh, Boskovice, where you have this uh, horror vacuum uh, decoration. Some emphasis on the ribs, which are not exactly ribs, but it is a, a structural issue. Then you have the 19th century interludium. Uh, this is the Rumbach synagogue by Otto Wagner, and this is not a real structure, it is a mock structure, the real structure is behind and it's steel. But nevertheless, this gives this Western idea of the Schinkeler's uh, structure and showing how the structure works. And you see that it's fake. And finally, you have a situation which is a sort of synthesis of this traditional um, decoration which is more or less independent from the structure and also emphasizing the structure, uh, the ribs on the reverse side of uh, This was my 20 minutes. <laughs> uh, this is a book published uh, half a year ago about this synagogue. I'm leaving it to the library. Uh, there is a circumstance uh, that it's written in Hungarian, but there is an unofficial English translation. If you email to me, I will uh, forward you the English translation. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, you're, you could all be, this could all be given by someone steeped in, in Hungarian uh, traditions and all that. Uh, but for some of you, um, if this seems odd or unique, every European country, almost without exception, has a, has a, has an, uh, a 19th century tradition of trying to adapt their uh, uh, folk traditions to a modern style. And, and here's a Hungarian application of this, but this is absolutely central to I mean, Gaudi, if you want, or um, even Saarinen later on, attempting to take the folk architecture and, and imply it. And here we have a Hungarian rendition of that. So this was, you know, in European uh, development, absolutely central to their 19th century uh, development. I have a question. Um, would you say that the Jewish community in Sumatica was more interested in acculturation and becoming Hungarian rather than in Segedin? Or it was just really their 
wish to have something new and different uh, because because you have also town hall, right? Yeah. Built by the same architect architects and in a similar style, Hungarian style. This is politics behind. Uh, Subotica was 50% uh, Slavonic and the uh, Hungarian style proposed by the Jews meant that they are supporting the Hungarian national project. Szeged was 99% Hungarian speaking. This is one thing. The other thing, the, Hungar the Szeged Jewish community was very established. They were producing the, they invented the Hungarian salami. You know the Hungarian salami, big and hats. So these were two Jewish families. They were really pillars of Hungarian culture, because at that period, Hungarian culture was Barto and cuisine. So, uh, in Szeged. In Szeged, yeah. And in Subotica, these were the Bunyevats, the Serbs, the Czechs, the Slovaks. So um, there was a very uh, interesting speech when they inaugurated the city hall, and the uh, architect uh, Jakob uh, delivered the speech, and saying that this style is to bring home the Slavonic population the superiority of Hungarian culture. And what was interesting, this speech was leaked out a day before by the Jewish journalist, so <coughs> Croats and Serbs took bad eggs and oh. rotten tomatoes, and the architect got all of it, and behind him was the ministry, Minister of Warfare of the Austro-Hungarian Empire, Baron Hazai Shamut, who was also Jewish. And the Hungarian noble, no, uh, 